something, this kind of gatherings reminds, especially young adults, that they are not alone in their commitment to peace and justice. There are people so much like yourselves in so many other countries who have very similar needs, wants, and concerns. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, and right there in South India, this is a major initiative uh, called One Billion Youth for Peace. You can see the website there. And that is an incredible mobilization where young adults in high school and college are invited to take a pledge for peace and then to activate what would they like to do to bring their pledge for peace into reality, into action. So you can visit their website and learn more about the Billion Voices for Peace, Youth for Peace. And that's happening right, as you can see, out of Kerala. And uh, in so it's not too far from Tamil Nadu. Okay, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and so when you take this pledge, Again, there are many different ways of how to implement the, the pledge. This is just sort of a picture of how the billion uh, voices, the billion voices for peace is mobilizing people. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Well, before I, I end, I would just also very, very much like to acknowledge the opportunity to be here with everybody. It's incredible to have such a big audience, to have so many colleges uh, come together. And I just hope this is the beginning of this kind of connecting, networking, being broader, extending into areas that we maybe haven't thought of before connecting with another college or another organization in order to accomplish something that's very dear to our hearts. So again, thank you to Dr. Sultan and everybody who worked to make this first International Youth Day call work for, for everybody. Okay, and our last slide. I just want to invite you again to explore the website at URI. And it is true, you'll see thousands of people. They're connecting. They have different efforts. They're from different countries. And again, I think what we are seeing is that global community does work. And whether we're students or professors, our elders, wherever we are in our lives, we can choose to be a part of this rising global community. People who do step up, it could be in a small way or a big way, but it is to say it's, I'm part of it. It's something that I want to have to give meaning to my own life. And to just say a word that when we started URI over 25 years ago, people said, oh, that's impossible. People of religion, they don't want to get together. And I know we haven't seen a complete transformation in the world. But that impossible went to probable. And I do believe that when you're on an impossible mission like this, it becomes a feeling of unstoppability. So I never let the impossible get me down. I just know that that's the real reason that to come together more and more to give our, our own lives meaning and to help make a better world. So thank you so much, everybody, for inviting me. It's really good to be with you. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Mahe, for the absolutely enlightening and engaging address, and also for your encouraging words of, to uh, help us be carriers of peace and justice. It was a very inspiring speech, Ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sundara Gurishad. She is a sustainability consultant at Holly, United Kingdom, 
With four years of professional experience and seven years of voluntary work experience in the sustainability sector, Ms. Gurishan has experience building sustainability, carbon management, microclimate analysis, and corporate sustainability across various sectors, especially commercial projects in the Middle East. She is currently focused on building a challenging career centered center around the above areas through research, practice, and advocacy. Ms. Gurishan describes herself as a keen self learner and an advocate of leading by example. For her, practicing what she preaches is a most stately quality. She is a strong advocate for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goals 13, 11, and 8, that is climate action, sustainable cities and communities, and decent work and economic growth, respectively. She is focused on creating sustainably built environments through youth empowerment to tackle climate change. Ms. Sundara Gurushev will now be guiding us through the terrain of sustainability and is here to clue us in on how net zero is possible. Over to you, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I see you've done your research on like what I do, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna try and keep it as short as possible and I'm currently based out of Dubai. So um, yeah, uh, before we start, I'd like to have an idea of how many engineering students or architecture students are on the call. Uh, if you could just raise your hands or give us a shout, that would be nice. Uh, okay, that's nice. There's an Apri, there's a Priyadarshini, there's a Suganya. Okay, that's nice. Interesting. Okay. So, um, to give you some background about myself, I am a sustainability consultant, uh, currently a coordinator with AESG Dubai, and I will be moving on as a sustainability consultant with Holi in uh, the UK. And I am from Tamil Nadu, so I do understand Tamil. And if any of you guys have questions, you're uh, I mean, you're welcome to like stop me at any time during my presentation and just ask me questions. I'm happy to like take questions at the end of the session as well. Uh, I'm just going to start presenting my screen. So let me know when you can see it. Um, okay. So... Uh, so today's session, uh, I mean, my part of the session is going to be around net zero buildings and about sustainable buildings and how it feeds into larger climate actions and larger climate plans that are being developed by different organizations around the world. Uh, to begin with, to give you some idea of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with a lot of green building certifications. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you all have heard about um, Estadama or Ralsa, but these are more uh, Dubai-based or UAE-based certifications. You must have heard about LEED, which is a USGBC green building certification, and uh, BREEAM, and there's obviously the IGBC certification that India offers, that the Indian Green Building Council offers. So what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I work with these green building certifications. We work with architects, we work with engineers, we work with a design team, and we kind of like advise them. And we, uh, you know, like do run different analysis and simulation and kind of like, you know, we uh, integrate ourselves in the design. And we encourage the team to be more energy efficient and water efficient and just conscious about their material resources and the kind of materials that they're using, the kind of uh, lights that they're using, the kind of HVAC systems that they're using and things like that. Um, so most of my work obviously centers around ASHRAE and uh, SIBSI guidance codes, uh, local legislation codes, and a lot of uh, these building codes that are put in place. I'm sure uh, India and in specific even Tamil Nadu has one in place. Um, moving on, I also work a lot with uh, in, like the whole life carbon analysis of a building, which means that we kind of evaluate how much of uh, carbon emissions is being emitted through the design or the construction of a particular building or master plans and, you know, like neighborhood communities and things like that. 
so uh, to give you an idea we have two different kinds of carbon when we talk about buildings we have embodied carbon and then we have operational carbon and embodied carbon is more to do with uh, the amount of carbon emissions that is already within your product and the carbon emissions that were emitted when you were creating a particular material for your building for example if you're um, if you're bringing concrete to site there are certain processes that go into the concrete making process and the cumulative carbon emissions that go into making that concrete is what we call as embodied carbon and operational carbon is obviously when um, obviously your buildings do require energy and then they uh, emit a lot of i mean they they consume a lot of energy which is also uh, causing carbon emission somewhere down the supply chain and that is also something that we look into and we try to uh, reduce on so these are some core impact categories that we work across and this is my specialization carbon management in buildings um now why is this important why is understanding how your buildings work and how, how why is understanding what is the carbon impact of your buildings and your master plans and your built environment important is because the climate crisis is real and it is and buildings contribute to close to 40% of global carbon emissions and we are single handedly the biggest contributors to climate change and it it and the thing is we need to like start doing something we need to start somewhere the concept of green buildings has always been around and we've only just recently in the past 10 years kind of taken to it and we are kind of like moving ahead with it we are getting our building certified we are looking into like how can we improve the efficiency how can we do something about our buildings how can we actively decarbonize our buildings that's something that is in the limelight right now but then uh, the concept of green buildings has been around for close to 20 25 years now uh the other reason is also because i'm sure uh, we read in the news this is just some news that i came across in the morning when i was uh, reading up on india's climate goals and india's climate change uh, commitments and things like that uh, one of the things that i noticed was india also is undergoing a lot of heat waves especially this year because i was in india earlier this year and i think it's the hottest i've hottest summer that i've faced in india in the 26 years of my life which is quite shocking because i'm like okay you know maybe like for people who say climate change is not real or like global warming is not uh, you know an immediate threat the thing is this is an indirect consequence of it these heat waves the uh, rain showers in december that uh, tamil nadu faces where you know chennai is like going on un undergoing a flood or like and even landslides in up when the monsoon sets in all of these are smaller impacts of this rapid urbanization that india is undergoing and these are all contributing to all of these bigger natural disasters that we read about in the news and which is why it's very very important that we look into india's climate change goals climate change commitments and we kind of like actively look into our own professions to like see how can we uh rapidly decarbonize what we are doing and how can we be more efficient and uh have lesser impact on the natural environment around us because the built environment is at the end of the day it is quite artificial and it will have an impact on the natural environment and it is up to us to like kind of be aware and like incorporate these findings and you know these best practices that is being followed all around the world into our building designs and into our um the way we treat design the way we look at design and the way we approach design needs to change and that's something that's that's quite critical at this point of time for india um another thing is in terms of carbon emissions again like i said uh, we do go into like the embodied carbon details and we go into uh, we try to understand the carbon emissions of a building itself and uh, like i mentioned earlier the embodied carbon typically comes from your products your transport the construction itself and maintenance and replacements because uh, your in a building if you have a facade your carbon your concrete probably is going to last you 60 years the guarantee that's given on a concrete material is uh, around 60 years but then like your glass typically 
has a guarantee of 15 years, which means that it will be replaced every 15 years over its lifetime. And uh, that is, again, something that we take into consideration when we do embodied carbon analysis and we look into the life cycle analysis of the building. And um, as you can see here on this graph, uh, most of our carbon emissions come from the products and the materials that we look into. So it's not just our duty as architects or engineers to like look into what kind of materials we're using. It also heavily relies on a supply chain. So um, students who are looking into material sciences or chemical engineering, it, it even applies to them to like take a look into what they actually do in their day job and they go like, okay, fine, you know, we have this particular material, we're testing it for um, sulfide, we're testing it for uh, ozone, we're testing it for uh, what is the sulfate content of uh, the material and things like that. But then it's very, very important that you also assess how much of energy has gone into making that material because it it, it plays a part into the whole life building, uh, whole life analysis of the building itself. Um, so this is, um, again, another reason, and like I mentioned earlier, we contribute to 40% of global carbon emissions. And within that 40%, 23 per, uh, within that 40 percent about 11 percent comes from concrete and then it comes from steel and aluminium like these are our major major contributors to embodied carbon emissions and in terms of um, cumulative carbon emissions what we tend to see is embodied carbon is pretty much set in stone once you design and once you once the building goes into construction there is little to no influence that you can play in terms of how much you can reduce that carbon that um, the, the carbon limit on that particular design so it's very important for us as architects like from early stages of design uh when we are doing our concept designs and things like that to like look into the kind of materials that we we'll potentially be looking into uh, to kind of assess what is the impact of it on the overall uh, uh embodied carbon of the building and uh, so, sorry, just give me a minute. So, uh, essentially, uh, what this graph is trying to illustrate is, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, uh, but if you can see it, uh, just can somebody please confirm if you can see my cursor? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So, um, essentially, what this graph is trying to say is, this is when, um, okay. So 2020 is when your building is being built or designed and constructed and your embodied carbon, that is the carbon that comes from your materials and construction is going to stay consistent throughout all the way till 2120 or 2120. And it's not going to change significantly over its lifetime. There will be a really, really slight increase in that carbon emissions, but it's not going to have a significant impact. So, and what ultimately at the end of the life is going to like contribute to the carbon emissions of a design or a building is going to be the operational carbon, which is going to contribute about 60% of the carbon emissions. And as you can see, it has a steep um, rise in terms of the amount of contribute, in terms of the contribution it's giving to the um, carbon emissions of a building. And this is mainly because what we tend to do is we tend to design for 2020, but then like we don't look into like what kind of uh, climates are we going to uh, face in like, you know, 20 years from now or 30 years from now. And when we design for 2020, what happens is our technology gets really outdated. So by the time you go into like, uh, to, uh, I mean, even by like 2050 or 2060, your building's already outdated. and your building's already not performing as well as it's supposed to be performing. So that's something that we, that's where we step in and we kind of go like, uh, when you're designing your building in 2020, we make sure that the design team considers all of these different factors and we kind of advise them on how to reduce, how to improve their energy performance, how to reduce their carbon emissions, what kind of materials can they look at and things like that. Now, there are some global commitments that we do work towards in the building, in the built environment. One of it is the World Green Building Council's Advancing Net Zero Project. Um, 
So as per according to the World Green Building Council, we are asked as an industry, as the built environment of the construction industry, to uh, ensure that all the all new buildings that are being built now from this day forth or from five years back forth uh, will operate at net zero carbon and uh, by 2050 100 percent of the buildings which means that irrespective of whether it's a new design or if it is a building that has been around for the past 50 80 years all of those buildings have to operate at net zero carbon by which they mean that they they are the amount of energy that they consume needs to be offset the amount of the kind of energy that they consume needs to come from clean energy and things like that which we'll uh, look at a little bit in the same detail uh, after these slides now uh, the concept of net zero is relatively new in the sense it's been around for around 15 years or a little longer uh, but we are, uh, and in the pathway to net zero, what we have established is another, is an interim target or a midway target where we ask buildings to go for as near zero as possible to net zero because it's not possible across all projects given um, budget constraints and costs and things to like kind of uh, completely switch to renewables or like completely switch to a different kind of uh, energy source. So what we ask them to do is we ask them to do uh, near zero buildings, which are really high efficient or high performing buildings, but uh, their energy utilization index is equal to or less than a particular defined target. Now these targets vary from place to place. Uh, for example, in Denmark, it's 25 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Um, in the UAE, it's uh, 90 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And in India, it's currently 225 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, which is something that the IGPC is actively working on to reduce uh, over the next, I think, uh, two to five years, if I'm not wrong. Um, so IGPC is the Indian Green Building Council, which kind of uh, does active research on the built environment side of things. And it is highly recommended for students, especially architecture and um, engineering students to like be a part of these uh, councils and be a pa part of these um, organizations. Just just volunteer with them and like learn from them because it really feeds back into what you do uh, once you graduate. Um, and so the way we approach near zero uh, targets or the way we approach near zero design is we first uh, do an assessment of where exactly in a building does our energy go. So in the UAE, it's typically for uh, space cooling and heating because, uh, I mean, we are out in a desert, desert so we definitely need a lot of uh, cooling in this area. Um, and then it goes into lighting, it goes into pumps and fans, it goes into our hot water demand and things like that. So this is the first assessment. So nearly 50% of our building's energy consumption goes into cooling in this part of the world. Um, again, so, uh, so when you look at it from a holistic perspective, what happens is uh, this feeds back into 18% of uh, global carbon emissions which is a significant amount. Now, what we do as consultants is uh, we take the passive design approach and we have this methodology. I'm sorry. Uh, I think there are a few questions or I'm not sure what's happening on the chat, but if there is something to be asked, please uh, unmute yourselves and ask me the question or like let me know because I'm not able to look at the chat. Um, so essentially we do the passive design approach and uh, we go into we take a very uh, we have a very interesting approach where we don't touch uh, hvac and lighting first we look at the building design itself first so we uh, assess what kind of sun parts are we looking at where uh, where do we have maximum solar radiation where are we getting maximum sunlight hours to you know place our renewable energy over there and uh, where is the maximum solar radiation? Where do we have to reduce the amount of windows that we are using? Where do we maximize the amount of windows that we are using and things like that? 
And on a master plan level, obviously, we look at how much of radiation we are getting on a site plan as a whole. And we kind of try to assess what are the heat spots, places where shading is definitely required, places where we can maximize on the uh, wind that is happening in that area and things like that. So once we put together these design strategies and we work with the architects and we, you know, optimize their design, then we go into the active measures, which is, uh, sorry, I've, okay. Which is more of a shopping list where we go like, okay, you know what, uh, yes, uh, uh, and it's more of a yes or no from the MEP team uh, and the client going like, hey, like this is too much of a cost impact for us, but then like, uh, what is the return on investment on this? So we kind of uh, go like, it's more like a shopping list. We go like, okay, you need to have a high efficiency motors, you need to have a variable uh, speed fans. You need to have temperature controls. You need to provide LED lighting. Uh, don't go fluorescent for LED. Uh, have monitoring systems in your um, uh, building. Have uh, you know occupancy and daylight controls for your building. So you know it's so the amount of energy that you actively use is reduced as a user as well. And if all of this is uh, being done, and if we still have a lot more energy that we have to kind of uh, not source from grid electricity then we go like okay let's uh, go for let's look into renewable energy options now in dubai it's mostly solar because uh, we get a lot of sun and solar is the most viable option for us so we do solar pv or solar thermal this is just a pictorial representation of uh, what happens what we so what we start off with we start off with the building orientation uh, how is the building responding to the climate? Uh, how is the building massing and the flow plan responding to the climate? What kind of daylight are we getting within our livable spaces? Like, for example, in a classroom, we want a lot of daylight, in our, not a lot of daylight to the point where it creates glare, but then like enough daylight for so as to like not rely on uh, lighting, for example. And also because it has health impacts as well, so we assess those kinds of things as well when we look at uh, daylight utilization natural ventilation then we go into the material selection we sit with the architects and we go like hey you know we i know you want to go for 100 percent uh ordinary portland cement because it's cheaper but then like you definitely i mean but then this would be a better alternative in terms of your environmental performance if you include recycled content in your cement so things like that. Uh, so we get into like the nitty gritty details like that. We sit with each design team member and we talk them to, through things. And obviously we support all of our uh, consultations with active analysis and research and, uh, you know, like speaking to the market, uh, understanding what's there in the market. And we obviously always, always keep the cost factor in mind. Um, so, yeah. Another important thing that we do at the end of all of this microclimate analysis and the life cycle analysis and the energy analysis that we do for a project is the commissioning process where we, uh, so once the building is built, we go on to site and we test if the building is working as per our design uh, considerations. And that's a very, very important thing that, uh, that needs to happen uh, during design and construction. Uh, the commissioning process is very important. It's usually overlooked uh, in some parts of the world, but then it's, it's an important process that we need to look into. Now, uh, going into how things work currently in the industry is we look into, uh, so typically what we do now is we have a project brief, we know what the site conditions are, we know what the weather conditions are, we know what the sustainability requirements are, the client tells us, okay, we want to go lead gold or like uh, we want to go IGBC, uh, um, new construction, gold certification, or we want BREEAM, very good certification. Whatever the criteria is, we are informed of it. We sit with the team, we brainstorm, we work with them, we do workshops, we conceptualize, then we run the analysis. And then it's just uh, the analysis more of a checkbox item that we do to make sure that it's complying with our codes. But uh, it's not the optimal solution. Uh, what we typically recommend and what we think as an in and what we are looking to move into as an industry is um, feeding back this analysis that we do at every stage back into the brainstorming stages of design. 
So across a design, you have different stages. You have concept, schematic, detailed, and tender design. So we try to like do analysis for each stage, and then we feed that back into the brainstorming uh, workshop for the next stage. So by the end of concept design, we know that our design is performing to like it is 20% energy efficient. Uh, it's able to provide adequate shading. It's able to it it probably has not considered enough uh, low carbon alternatives in terms of material replacements. So we want to like feedback all of this analysis back into the brainstorming cons uh, brainstorm storming sessions at the end at the beginning of schematic design. So this is something that we are trying to do with clients, and there is a lot of uh, openness and invite like there is a lot of um, Welcome to this approach, but then again, the the rate at which it is being integrated is slow, and this is something that we are trying to like speed up across like all our projects and across all our clients. Um, so this is just a little uh, detail on uh, what we do with lifecycle analysis. analysis. Um, lifecycle analysis, like I mentioned, uh, we do embodied and uh, we do embodied and operational carbon analysis and we kind of try to understand what is the carbon impact of a building over a certain period of time. Typically this is 60 years but it can be more or less depending on uh, the amount of information that we get from the client on how the building is going to be used. So we have and in terms of resource contribution uh, this is based off a real life case study that we had done and it's for an actual project that we had worked on and Typically, the major contribution comes from concrete, and the major building component that contributes to it is the superstructure. Um, and in terms of uh, reductions for this particular building, uh, I think it was a building of about 36,000 something square meters, and uh, we uh, were able to achieve a 61% reduction just by replacing. Uh, a part of the cement with recycled content, which is GGBS or slag or, uh, you know, like fly ash or things like that. This is something uh, that is being taken in by the industry currently, and it is something that we are adopting into our design activities. So again, uh, this was something that we did to like see what will happen if we were to retrofit the project with PV, and like you can see. Um, the embodied carbon, obviously, the baseline case is quite high, and then the current design is uh, the embodied carbon had a 61% reduction. We tried maintaining it, uh, so we. Uh, hi, Sundra. Yeah. Uh, if kindly, could you wrap up because uh, the other speaker is working? Oh ah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Maybe another two minutes, possible. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so to give you an idea of how this feeds back into the sustainability strategy is uh, we kind of, once we do all of these analyses, we obviously work with developers and uh, people like that and we kind of uh, tell, like advise them on the kind of uh, certifications to look at, the kind of visions that they have to set as organizations and then how to actively decarbonize their portfolio as well. So it's something that we do as a business, and it's something that uh, I've also done for my university campus here in Dubai. So this is just to like take you through the sustainability journey. Uh, there were quite a few slides, so like I need to like cut short. I'm gonna like uh, skip through this. This is the corporate sustainability side of things where we look into material topics and things like that. One uh, interesting uh, thing that we come across is uh, came across is the climate action tracker. There's one for India. I can give me a minute. Um, okay, uh, I can maybe just pop a link into the chat box and you can take a look at it. Uh, Uh, so one really interesting thing that we looked at was the climate action tracker, which actually tells you how well or how not well the country is doing based on their policies and based on the actions that they are taking uh, in terms of climate action. Are they insufficient, sufficient? Uh, are they compatible with global targets or not? Uh, the UAE is currently highly insufficient in terms of the policies that have been set across in spite of having very, very ambitious policies. 
uh, India too is highly insufficient in terms of its climate action, which is something that uh, our governments need to take notice of. Um, the other thing is, uh, so in terms of how can you help as the youth, uh, I'm 26 years old and uh, I have, I know it looks like I have a lot of experience, but then I'm only 26 and it, it the experience largely comes from being active in various organizations uh, locally and internationally. I work with SIBZI, I work with uh, the Environment Agency in uh, Abu Dhabi and things like that. Another key active participation that I took part in was the solar decathlon where I actually learned how important it was to like decarbonize our buildings. There is a solar decathlon India version of it which is accepting uh, applications if any of you are interested in taking part. Uh, the most you can do to like you know help us and like just just join the workforce and learn be curious like proactively learn about green buildings learn about uh, how sustainable cities are being built and like what kind of models are we looking at and these are things that i know from experience that are not incorporated in our curriculum or it's not within our syllabus but these are things that needs to be learned and these are things that needs to be adopted in india especially because india is such a massive country and every part of india has a different climate uh, condition that you have to respond to and every design strategy that you put in place for any part of india is quite unique to that particular site or that particular region and it's very, very important that we network, you participate, you act, and you're aware of everything that is happening globally. But yeah, uh, that's about it from my end. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take uh, questions at the end of the session, maybe. Thank you so much, Sundra, for your mm -hmm. very informative talk. We really enjoyed your talk. Um, since we don't have time for any questions, the students will reach out to you if you could just show your final slide of your contact. Uh, I can just put it in the chat box if anybody wants to reach out to me. That's all right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sundra, for joining us. No Thank you, Ms. Gursha, for your innovative ideas on how to build near net zero buildings. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and the work you do. So we now have Dr. Sultan Khalifa Harun Al Rashid. He is the UN Sustainable Development Goals Student Program Regional Officer for Asia Pacific, USA, SDSNU. Dr. Sultan is a wanderlust who has traveled across six continents in pursuit of education and adventures. Previously trained at Anna University, Amity University, National University of Singapore, University of California, Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, Imperial College London and RMIT University. Some of Dr. Sultan's achievements are that he was a recipient of the Australian government's Global Distinguished Talent Award for his contribution to the field of medical technology. He proposed a principle to diagnose COVID-19 from human breath and he is one among the 239 experts that wrote to WHO that COVID-19 is an airborne disease. He closely works with many organizations across the globe such as Diabetes Australia, UNESCO, Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, and Kubulaki Nandar. Adding to his long list of formidable feats is the invention of a miniature sensor that could potentially diagnose diabetes and breast cancer from human breast. I'd also like to thank Mr. Sultan for his tireless efforts in making this day a reality. So now I would like to invite Dr. Sultan Khalifa to spell out the ABCD of climate change. Over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, incredible opportunity. Um, I'm sorry, I'm standing by a tree uh, to do this entire uh, next 20 minutes, but I'm sure I'll be as, um, as reachable I can. So, do you all see my slides? Human enhanced greenhouse effects is not. Okay, can you see my slides now? Yes, sir, yeah. Okay, yes, fantastic. Sir. You all see a house is burning, yeah? It's just the situation, not just us. It's the house of the birds, animals, and people who are living by the forest. Yes, I'm going to talk about climate change, some of the fundamentals of climate change. 
and you will know what is the significance of this figure in quite few time. What is basically a climate change? Okay, let me ask you a question. In the month of May, in India, can you wear five suits? You know, right now I'm wearing one and unfortunately I can't bear the heat. But imagine if I'm wearing five suits on the month of May and walking on the streets of Chennai. It's absolutely not possible. At the same time, I at least need one shirt to protect my body. So that is the situation today. You can see on the one side, the greenhouse gas, we need a certain amount of layer of greenhouse gas that's around the earth to protect us from the harmful radiations of the sun. But at the same time, we cannot afford to have a very thick layer of greenhouse gases. So in the thin layer of greenhouse gases, when the solar radiation from the sun comes into the earth and it gets re-radiated back into the atmosphere, just because we have emitted very too much of carbon dioxide in the process of producing energy, in the process of uh, making our lives much sophisticated, we have emitted very too much of uh, gases. That's carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, and all the forms of greenhouse gases, which have made the layer much, much thicker. So now what happens when the solar radiation come into the earth, it cannot go back just because it's a very strong layer. So the heat get trapped across the earth. So greenhouse gases layer அப்படிங்கறதும் அப்படிங்கறத அடுத்த ஸ்லைட்ல பாப்போம் இந்த திஸ் ஸ்லைட் ஐம் கோயிங் டு டாக் அபௌட் தி டிஃபரண்ட் gases தட் இஸ் எமிட்டட் யூ نو वी प्रोड्यूस எனர்ஜி டுடே பை 버னிங் கோல் वी आर यूजिंग காஸ் பை 버னிங் பெட்ரோல் அண்ட் தேர் ஸோ many forms of emissions happening across the globe there's methane carbon dioxide nitrous oxide இது எல்லாம் கலந்து தான் green house gas அது மட்டும் இல்லாம நம்ம பூமியை சுத்தி இயற்கையாவே வாட்டர் வேப்பர் அப்படிங்கற ஒரு தன் துகள்களும் இருக்கு இங்க நீங்க பாருங்க ஆர்டிக் சம் முன்னாடி ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி முன்னாடி வந்து அந்த சிகப்பு வட்டம் தெரியுது பாத்தீங்களா பவுண்டரி அதுவரை வந்து ஐஸ் இருந்துச்சு ஆனா இந்த ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பதினஞ்சுல இருந்து ரெண்டாயிரத்தி முப்பதுக்குள்ள ஐஸ் இவ்வளவு தூரம் உருகி இருக்கு இதுக்கு என்ன காரணம் தெரியுமா நம்ம பூமியை சுத்தி வெப்பமாகும் போது நேச்சுரலாவே பனிப்பாறைகள் உருள உரி சாரி உருக ஆரம்பிக்கும் எப்படி ஒரு சின்ன சூடான பாத்திரத்துல ஒரு சின்ன பீஸ் ஆஃப் ஐஸ போட்டீங்கன்னா ஐஸ் உருகிட்டே இருக்கும்ல அதே மாதிரிதான் பூ அதிகமாயிருச்சு <laughs> அதிகமாயிருச்சு அப்படின்னா ஈஸியார் அப்படிங்கிற இடமே இல்லாம போயிரும் அது எல்லாம் கடல்ல மூழ்கிறோம் அது மட்டும் கிடையாது ஐ டோல்ட் யூ தெர் இஸ் சர்டன் அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் ஹீட் அக்ராஸ் த அர்த் அப்போ தர சூடாகும் மண்ணு சூடாகும் காடு எல்லாம் வந்து ஆட்டோமேட்டிக்கா அந்த வெப்பத்தை தாங்க முடியாம சருகுகள் எல்லாம் தீப்பிடிச்சு எரிய ஆரம்பிக்கும் நிலம் சூடாச்சுன்னா என்ன ஆகும் சொல்லுங்க அந்த இடத்துல விவசாயமே பண்ண முடியாது நம்ம எவ்வளவுதான் தண்ணி ஊத்தினாலும் it won't be uh, efficient or it will not give the amount of uh, yield that it's supposed to give okay we humans nama enna panipom when there is excessive heat or air conditioner vaangi maatipom rendu air conditioner maati maatipom veed full ave air conditioner maatuvom ana what will the poor people will do what the poor people living on the roads will do what about those indigenous people who are living in the uh, forest deserts uh, will do you know they do not have any technology to substitute climate change now i'm going to show you this image this image was taken in the year 2020 and this is melbourne that's where i was living um you can see how uh, gassy it has become idnala vande melbourne la kittatta oru varam bayangaramana pugai mandalam irundhuchu engalaala swasikkave mudiyala 
lot of young children also died because of this. Idhika adi pade karan enna solrangna climate change nala temperature increase aanu thanala kaattu thi pudichirchu appdin solli. Ippo konja naalaikku munadi Tamilagathila kuda kurangani appingra or edathila kaattu thi pudichichu. Yaarala namma yaaralayad yosikka mudiyada. Australia mari or paale vanathila thi pudicha paravalla. Tamilagam madri pasumeyana or kaattu pagudhila thi pudikidha appingrathu have showed us how extreme the weather conditions have changed. Now I come to this question of plastics. Although plastics do not have any direct link with global warming, uh, we do throw quite a lot of plastics into the uh, earth. So into the sea, uh, into the river, then the river takes all those plastics to the sea. Now you can see the terrible situation of these animals. I want to ask you a question. What have this innocent animal have done? Now I'm showing you some of the images that's taken in Amazon forest and in um, Australia, you know, I saw a koala bear, the very cute koala bear got completely burnt, a little baby ko koala bear and, and was really struggling to live. I saw that that's when my heart cried. You know, I can't still remember the day one more time. Now, I told you the, the, the temperature around the earth increases. What happens is the surface of the sea will also increase. At the same time, the surface of surface temperature of the sea will also increase. So, if in the Pawala Paragal Elathe Ninga Pakringa, Kadaloda Matatala, Irka Vepa Madia Mahumbode, in the Pawala Paragalala and the Vepatala, Wala Uir Walabe Mudia. So, Unadi in the Pawala Paragal in a Gavalo the Alinsi Poetry Cup in Paranga, Iduka Karnum, Bumi Vepa Mai Magadalda. In the Kivandi Vivasa, Mela Adathalim Poetu Poetry. The, the agriculture is, has completely demolished because of the climate change. A country like Madagascar have completely lost its vegetation. So naturally, what will happen? If you look at Tamil Nadu, there is no climate change in Tamil Nadu, there is no climate change in Tamil Nadu, there is no climate change in Tamil Nadu. This is all because of climate change. So, we will go to the flight and fly. But we will go to the flight and fly. We will go to the flight and fly. That's not the case. அரசாங்கங்கள் ஆல்ரெடி இமிகிரேஷன் பாலிசிஸ் எல்லாத்தையும் டைட் பண்ணிட்டு இருக்காங்க நீ ஏன் நாட்டுக்குள்ள வரக்கூடாது நான் ஓன் நாட்டுக்குள்ள வரக்கூடாது அப்படின்னு ஸோ திங்க் ஆஃப் த சுச்சுவேஷன் ஆஃப் தீஸ் பீப்புள் இஃப் யூ எவர் கோ டு மண்ணடி ஸ்பெஷலி டுவர்ட்ஸ் தி ரயில்வே ஸ்டேஷன் யூ வில் சி லாட் ஆஃப் பீப்புள் லிவிங் ஆன் த ரோட் ஆன் அ ட்ரை சைக்கிள் திங்க் ஆஃப் தேர் லைஃப்ஸ் ஸோ ஹியர் இஸ் ஆர் டெல்லி யூ நோ வி ஆர் எமிட்டிங் வே டு டூ மச் ஆஃப் கார்பன் டை ஆக்சைட் அண்ட் திஸ் இஸ் வாட் டெல்லி இஸ் அபவுட் ஆல் அபவுட் யூ கேன் ஹார்ட்லி ப்ரீத் இன் டெல்லி Now I come to this very important question, my friends. This, these are the people, the indigenous people, the people of the land. Um, you know, since we are emitting way too much of carbon dioxide, their temperature is also changing. But we people live in the modern cities, adopt to these changes. Now, what about these people? Please think about their lives. You know, do you think they can uh, live without food just because the agriculture is completely gone? Do you think they cannot? they can live without water do you think they can uh, they can live without rain so this is a very important question we all have to ask now i come to some of the most important problems of global warming now sonna madri romba vekka adhigamaachu namma velila poga mudiyala sooda irukku appadina first thing enna aagum paathina wild fires ella varum adukaprom romba veppam adhigam irukkanaala nilathadi neer vandu kammi aagum ozone layer la ootta ulugum மக்கள் என்ன பண்ணுவாங்க ஒரு பகுதியில இருந்து இன்னொரு பகுதிகளுக்கு புலம் பெயர்ந்து போவாங்க அது மட்டும் இல்லாம இன்னைக்கு யோசிச்சு பாருங்க சென்னையில மே மாசம் ஒரு ஒரு மணி நேரம் வெயில நடந்துட்டு நம்மளால வீட்டுக்கு திரும்ப வந்தா என்னென்ன பிரச்சனை எல்லாம் இருக்கும் வி ஹாவ் ஹார்ட் ரிலேட்டட் ப்ராப்ளம் என்வாய்மெண்டல் அலர்ஜிஸ் ரெஸ்பிரேட்டரி டிசீஸ் கார்டியோவாஸ்குலர் டிசீஸ் மோஸ்ட்லி மென்டல் ஹெல்த் ப்ராப்ளம்ஸ் கொரோனா டைம்ல நம்மளால வீட்டுக்குள்ளேயே கொஞ்ச நாள் வாழ முடியல ஆனா ஒரு அவன்ல உட்கார்ந்து இருக்க மாதிரி எல்லா டைமும் ஹீட்டா இருக்க ஒரு உலகத்துல நம்ம எப்படி வாழ போறோம்னு யோசிங்க so this will basically bring some changes in our heart now i come to sustainable development goals i'm not going to lecture much of sustainable development goals because it is a very very important education we all need to know all the sustainable development goals have a interconnection with the, with each other i request all the principals who are attending this function to conduct an eloquence competition or a speech competition or a writing competition about one of these sustainable development goals and please teach the children what is sustainable development goals indiki vandha nama yaarum phone illama oru nimisham kuda uyir vaalradilla ella neramum whatsapp la nama message pannit irukom so please 
எல்லாரும் கூகுள் பண்ணி பாருங்க இந்த ஒவ்வொரு சஸ்டைனபிள் டெவலப்மெண்ட் கோல்ஸ் என்ன இந்த சஸ்டைனபிள் டெவலப்மெண்ட் கோல்ஸ் நம்ம அடையறதுக்கு எவ்வளவு பிரச்சனைகள் நமக்கு இருக்கு அது எல்லாத்தையும் நீங்க தெரிஞ்சுக்கிட்டாலே இந்த கோல்ஸ் எல்லாம் உங்களுக்கு தெரிஞ்சிடும் சோ இந்த பதினேழு கோல்ஸை நம்ம அச்சீவ் பண்ணிட்டாலே இந்த சமூகத்துல பெரிய மாற்றங்களை நம்ம கொண்டு வர முடியும் வி ஆல் கேன் பிரிங் கிரேட் சேஞ்சஸ் இன் தொசைட்டி பை அச்சீவிங் த சஸ்டைனபிள் டெவலப்மெண்ட் கோல்ஸ் தட்ஸ் ஆல் ஃப்ரம் மீ தட்ஸ் ஆல் த ஏபிசிடி ஆஃப் கிளைமேட் சேஞ்ச் now i have the responsibility of thanking all my mentors across the globe i had the opportunity to travel six continents for education and i thank each one of them for the kindness basically um more more than education what they have taught me is compassion standing up for this environment standing up for science standing up for those marginalized people so i thank them so much for all these uh, support guidance and love and the inspiration they have given me i thank each and every one of the organizer uh i do know there's so many of them participating so it would not be right if i say some names and leave out somebody so i thank all the organizing colleges participating colleges and my beloved speakers nega uh, meg uh, neha um um sundara sali and the sister uh, zara for their contribution in this uh, event and finally here is my email address Uh, my linkedin profile and fa- facebook profile feel free to contact me any questions you have and thank you so much for joining me thank you thank you so much sir uh, we could you know really see how passionate you are for the cause right from the way you speak to us and bring up really very simple examples with which all of us can relate to i'm sure all of us as students will take this up and uh, will definitely uh, make sure that we lead a sustainable life Our next speaker is Zara Nadeem. She is the founder and CEO of iGrow Innovative Solutions LLP. In 2022, Ms. Nadeem embarked on a wonderful entrepreneurial journey with her partner Syed Nadeem to make modern agriculture available and affordable to everyone. iGrow Innovative Solutions focuses on microgreens and hydroponics. With this vision Zara Nadeem started a business at the age of 35 with no resources and funding Starting a business is hard but it is harder to sustain With experience as a teacher Ms Nadeem has worked with students in building their self confidence and getting work done in a fun way leaving them inspired Ms Nadeem is a baker by passion who took to the baking line during the pandemic and is now a small business owner She will be sharing her views on the topic women for future food sustainability handing over the session to ms nadi hello everyone i am really happy to be part of this un sdg program on this international youth day uh, really glad to be among uh, all of you as a speaker for today so i'll be addressing on sorry yes please okay so uh, so food sustainability is a great uh, topic to talk about because as you said i have a vision to make no, i think you are on your uh... yes thank you so as you said uh, uh, i grow is with a vision to make modern agricultural ways more affordable and available to everyone and uh, we are passionate to encourage the youth to uh, for local food production and equip it, and we equip them with all the hydroponic models why hydroponic now the land uh, space available in the city model is really difficult so a lot of them are giving up on kitchen gardening or home gardening to uh, start their own little garden for little produce that they can do so hydroponic is really going to help even if you have a small space at your home so keeping this uh, stackable hydroponic system is going to make you produce any little food that you can for your everyday life be it herbs be it small vegetables like uh, tomatoes um, green chilies anything like that so uh, we have our uh, first concept store why we have a concept store is like many people don't know like when it comes to hydroponic they think it's a big project it's a very commercial thing like how can we do it at home so to make educate people on the uh, hydroponic and microgreens we have it as a concept store where people can walk in and uh, experience they can have a taste of the freshly grown vegetables 
and they can compare it with the uh, ready ones available in the grocery stores so they get to know how better it is to grow their own food so let's get into my topic uh, sustainability is the ability to exist and develop without depleting natural resource for the future so how do we how do we relate it to the food so if we can grow food to support human life in the present situation as well as keeping the natural resources uh, without depleting for the future generation then you are doing it right the food sustainability is going to take place so with the increasing population the uh, increase the trend in eating different food uh, so you for uh, recently uh, during the pandemic time nobody were going out so all these food uh, supply uh, apps the food the supply apps like swiggy zomato they were all uh, emerging so the variety of uh, food that people want to try the quantity of food that they are trying how much we used to go to hotels before so once these apps have come we are ordering food very frequently nothing just uh, very hot you want to order a milkshake like before it, it was not like that you can go to a near local supplier get some milk and make the milkshake by yourself which is more environment friendly than to go to a restaurant just imagine what is happening like that uh, uh, food uh, supply company is going to use a uh, transport to come and give your uh, milkshake to you so your uh, uh, the carbon footprint is going to in increase because of the transportation so uh, what they say is uh, about 60 to 70% of the uh, food demand is going to increase and also 70% of planet's fresh water is being used for growing your plants so food sustainability cannot be achieved by making the world's agriculture system bigger you cannot occupy more forest lands and change it into agricultural lands instead you can make transform it into something new what is new use less floor space make it stackable and recycle the water which is nothing but hydroponics so now with this new trend of vertical garden system you can grow more in less ground space utilized by the system who said vertical garden system is only for a landscaping or for a commercial farm you can grow vegetables herbs like coriander lettuce whatever you want and the flowers to make it beautiful and also edible flowers like chamomile are all possible to grow it in your hydroponics at home all this in a single tower you can grow it and you can cater to the needs of your family you really don't have to step out for exotics anymore apart from the food security that is being able to feed the present and the future the food sustainability can be viewed from three more aspects that is environmental economic and social so at every stage of food system from agriculture production pro processing and retailing to the final consumption so what do i mean by the en environmental aspect is that to meet the emerging demands of uh, food the more food produced should be happening so what do they do they add lot of fertilizers pesticides chemicals and they spoil the soil so that again it cannot be used for agriculture so you are so spoiling the natural resource which is soil and so what happens so you are not say uh, reserving the soil for the future generation that is really bad on the other side now the increased trend to eat animal based foods have resulted in greenhouse gases like methane the one that comes from the manure of the animals and nitrous oxide the ones that is emitted by the plants grown for the animal feed we never knew that the plants that the grasses that are grown for an animal feed is going to emit uh, greenhouse gases that is very bad we are not asking to completely reduce i mean completely cut down on animal feed we are asking to reduce like go to your uh, the, uh, go to your uh, uh, local farmer local uh, animal uh, uh, grow, uh, growing person and get the pro proceeds from them don't go into a commercial person so even for vegetables go to your local farmer go to your uh, in say we are uh, we are uh, encouraging youth from apartments to start their own local business for microgreens or hydroponics why you can start 
becoming you can start your own entrepreneurial journey you can you can start it in your own apartment to start selling your own supply that, so you become your local farmer there is no transportation cost incurred like why should you pay so much the only tra- the cost for producing the plant is really less the cost that is added for transportation packaging those things are only adding up to the cost of the produce so it is not being affordable to many people so come on, coming to the economic aspect there are many ways you can help food sustain so eat local as i said if the food originates close to where you live it requires less energy to transport it to you and refrigerate it on its way so when you say leafy greens you have to keep it fresh so you need refrigeration time it requires less energy to transport it to you so you don't need a tra- separate uh, air conditioned vehicle to transport it from some other far away farm or import it from somewhere uh, another country so traveling a shorter distance also means fewer emissions use reduce on the carbon footprint eat seasonally so seasonal fruits like watermelon mango eat seasonally summer it is available eat only in that time don't ask it for in winter so producing it all through the year is going to ha- uh, require lot of uh, energy and it also uh, we we are also changing the normal like it, it it kind of becomes a hybrid produce it won't be the natural fruit so to grow it out of the season which causes greenhouse gases gases emissions again so eat more variety increasing the diversity of what you eat promotes diversity in agriculture which in turn is better for the environment reduce wastage this is the very big problem as mr Sul- dr sultan said please reduce the wastage why should uh, the uh, tribal people suffer for no food because we pay we waste so much of food about 40% of food ends up being thrown away which means all the resources that was uh, utilized to grow that food grow that produce has been totally wasted and has gone to the bin along with the food so we can at least use the food that was wasted utilized by somebody else who is less fed or not even fed so these are many organ there are many organizations helping to distribute the excess food at households or occasions to the needy so let's tie up with that and create no wastage food food no food wastage in any future occasions that we have in our households and the last is the social aspect as said before the agricultural resources or the food itself should be made available and affordable for everyone that creates food for all making the country go zero hunger so how do we do it educate the women there are women contrib- contributes to about uh, 40 uh, for 33% of cultivators and 47% of agriculture laborers so give them the uh, give them the knowledge and information regarding the latest advancements and in in the methods of farming and facilities available so that will make them increase the produce uh, how many of us know there is a separate word for a woman farmer called farm rep not mo- most of us they only say a lady, girl, lady farmer a woman farmer there is a separate word called farm rep Uh, wim- so this uh, international women's day so zara that's fantastic to know i've never heard this term before um and kindly take another 5 minutes to wrap up your session okay sure thank you very much thank you. Uh, so uh, the international women's day march 8 2022 the international maize and wheat improvement center ce- celebrates the essential role that women play in agriculture and food systems and acknowledges that gender equality is essential to achieve a sustainable future so men and women i am not say i am not going against men give equal education to the women support women farmers support the farmers and encourage them to uh, grow more produce so if you do that they can serve they can increase their yield about 20 to 30% which will feed about millions of people and it will lift a lot of people from going hungry to bed so for example in the last year the research has found out that educating women farming wheat in bihar india increases the adaptation of climate smart agriculture practices which in turn produce reduces 
reduces greenhouse gases emissions and boosts nitrogen productivity, eco efficiency, and the yield. So, educating in Bihar, just imagine the education the level the women are going to get. So, if you can support the rural women in Bihar, just imagine the youth of the cities. Like you all are already educated, you are very well aware of how. Uh, what are what is going on? What is climate change? What is uh, uh, all, what is that greenhouse gases? All of you must be aware. So if you all get into agriculture, local food production, what change you are going to bring? So they say, as goes the face, fate of the women, so goes the fate of the world. So educate the women farmers, give them equal resources, land, credit education, extension services, these workers could increase their food production by 20 to 30 percent and lift millions of people from hunger. So women, why women? Women, like uh, the, she has, she's associated with patients. A woman can patiently hold a child within her for 10 months without knowing even the gender. So with that patience, she can slowly uh, do the sapling stage, which can harvest the produce very gently. The plant can keep giving more and more produces. So, uh, I'm not saying the men won't do that, but a woman can do much better because she's associated with little more patients. And uh, so, yeah, and women are the more uh, women are more food producers and food providers at home. So when you they are also the caretakers of home, the main source of care that they provide at home is through the food. So you're not well, mommy keeps a soup for you. You're not uh, you're uh, tired from uh, going outdoor sports. She gets a quick juice for you. So she is the ultimate care provider. So a woman can do it. All, all you youth can do it. The future can change the present. The present is spoiling the environment. Don't worry. You get into the system, change the present. So I thank the opportunity given to me to be a part of this uh, international youth. Day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Nadim, for educating us on the importance of the environment and teaching us about food sustainability and how we can chip in for its growth and expansion. It was very informative and encouraging. Thank you. Finally, to tie up our Youth Day festivities, we have with us Ms. Neha Gupta. Ms. Gupta is currently an incoming freshman at the University of Toronto. Her current pursuits reflect her passion for scientific research, public speaking, digital entrepreneurial innovation, and human rights related advocacy. She is the founder of STEM Powerment, a nonprofit organization based on Twitter, which seeks to amplify voices in the scientific community, as well as bring awareness to the social issues rooted in science. Neha is also the co-founder of Dimensions Magazine, an organization that aims to engage all high school and undergraduate students in science by publishing student written articles. She hopes for you to understand what power and impact we hold by simply sharing our ideas. Neha is also a Regeneron ISEF alumni and a TEDx speaker. We're looking forward to Ms. Neha Gupta catalyzing our young minds with her address on gender equality through quality education. Over to you, Ms. Gupta. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, could I get a confirmation that you can all hear and see me? Yeah, yeah, again. Great, thank you very much. So let me begin by thanking the organizers of this event for allowing us to all hear and learn from each other today. I hope that we can all emerge as more global and humane citizens after today's events. Regardless of where in the world you've joined today's event from, me from California, I'm actually based in Toronto, I'm glad to be addressing everyone through this online platform. As you know, my name is Neha Gupta, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a recent high school graduate from Ontario, Canada, entering the University of Toronto, and I'm also the founder of Dimensions Magazine, a youth-led organization which, yes, publishes youth-written articles about science in an accessible online format. My cultural and social upbringing, as well as the current state of the world, has made me passionate about the need for social change and the power of youth. 
Four years ago, I first became consciously involved in advocacy and have since been a part of initiatives like Dimensions, centered around empowering girls and promoting science and education. In doing so, I believe in empowering today's youth to promote sustainable infrastructure towards educating more of the world's girls. In many ways, the fourth and fifth United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have been a lens through which I've lived my life. Fittingly so, my talk today will be centered around quality education and gender equality. Since its creation in 1945 in direct response to the abuses of World War II, the United Nations holds true to its purpose of connecting the world as nations over the promotion of peace and dialogue. Now, if we viewed our world through the lens of the UN's foundational hopes, we'd see a world where individual countries would truly transcend their borders. We'd begin to think of a nation not just as a landmass with a population, but a mosaic of vibrant culture, innovation, and constant potential for global progress. In September of 2015, the UN created the well-known Sustainable Development Goals meant to be achieved by the year 2030. With each sustainable development goal aimed specifically at a particular pillar, foundation to an, foundational to an equitable world, the SDGs have since allowed many to manifest these goals into tangible actions towards our communities globally. A shared interest in these sustainable development goals is truly what unites us as global citizens and is why we are all here today. The sustainable development goal numbers four and five refer directly to the empowerment of people, which is what gives them so much urgency. Empowerment through means of education is a vital tool to better position communities towards collective prosperity. Education is a unique means of empowerment as it often works not just on an individual level, but a community level. Women and girls are one populations of people who have been systematically restricted from accessing an education, thus limiting the potential and autonomy of about half of the global population. It has long since been concluded thus that educating the world as girls is vital if lasting and multi-generational positive change is to be seen in our communities. Sustainable development goal number four outlines the need for quality education to be accessible by all those who seek to learn. SDG number four's message was reiterated by the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, stating that everyone has a right to an access and education, that elementary education shall be compulsory, and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. It is human nature to want to know, discover, and understand. To know is to be aware of our power and position in the world. Education instills in us a sense of duty to our communities, allowing us to understand in which ways we can best be a part of our immediate and larger surroundings. Education fuels rationality, curiosity, and encourages progressiveness of thought. The power to know also encompasses the power to share, thus creating a self-sustaining cycle of the sharing of knowledge. The lives of every individual on earth can be enhanced through the prioritization of education. For women and girls, this further provides a route towards economic and social autonomy, which many are restricted from. According to UNESCO, improvements to girls' education between the years 1990 and 2009 saved 2.1 million children under the age of five. Education would also allow for a sustainable source of income, contribution to the broader economy, and would increase a woman's ability to be safe. It also means that we can let more people tap into and discover their potential. Such large-scale issues like girls accessing an education while sharing the same initial root cause have over time become intertwined with other societal issues which feel more disparities. We can almost imagine this issue today as a well-established tree. Digging beneath the soil uncovers thousands of crisscrossing root systems, feeding the issue and compounding the damage to communities. To be able to tackle issues like these, instead of hacking at the thick tree base, we need to begin by addressing the interwoven roots. And for this, we need youth to begin understanding the importance of education early on so that we can continue to spread this knowledge for as long as possible. Think of the power our generation will hold if we all believe in the importance of education. Our collective advocacy and sharing of our opinions would hold significantly more power. Barriers standing in the way of girls' education are largely associated with the implied belief of the role of the girl, needing to care for family. Families who may not have a comfortable financial lifestyle may find more value in sending children to seek work and provide another source of income to the household rather than investing in an education. 
For girls, this means either being sent to find a means to make money or, especially common in Asian nations, being sent to be married so that there's one less mouth to feed. Thus, girls are sidelined and are not present in schools. When girls cannot access an education in early life, it becomes significantly harder for these girls to ever access an education later in life, given more responsibilities in the household and the cumulative nature of schooling. In order to bring girls into the classroom, communities first need to be made aware of the value in educating girls and of the potential currently being stifled. Making communities more aware of the benefits of educating girls will create a positive feedback loop and will secure a future for more girls. It is also important that education from a young age is stressed, as this can build the foundations of a successful, empowered, and confident student. While statistics do show that less girls being in the less girls are in the classroom where classrooms are made available, in many nations it is significantly difficult for any youth to learn at all. In countries like the United Kingdom, Sweden, and Australia, which have well-established education systems and many opportunities for higher education, youth are exposed to learning from a young age, are made aware of the benefits education provides, and are thus motivated to continue learning. However, education systems in nations like Chad, Nigeria, and Burkina Faso, which are poorly supported economically by their government, mean low literacy rates and preference towards child labor and a marriage. So when such inequalities couple with gender constructs, it becomes easier for to first direct girls away from schools rather than boys instead of attempt to tackle the systemic barrier stopping children from learning. By making education more accessible for all, families will no longer have to think twice about letting their girls study and would be exposed to the value to help them learn. From campaigning for the, lo the opening of a new local girls' school to running educational camps for youth and adults, there are many possible grassroots efforts which can be led by youth and can work towards this meaningful goal. The world is not inherently a place where women and girls are built to be held back, but communities have been shaped in such a way that women and girls find themselves restricted. Oppression is not a spontaneous occurrence, but instead is the complex product of the size of a community, a struggle for power, and hope to dominate. Unfortunately, entire societies are built off of the oppression of certain peoples and ways of living. The continued oppression of women and girls is no different. And whilst a significant and commendable progress has been made and continues to be made to empower women and girls across the world, there are more communities and people still to reach. Just like sustainable development goal number four, the compounding damage due to a lack of SDG number five, gender equality is a result of equal opportunity. For example, the latest report from the International Labor, Organiz Labor Organization highlights that consistent gender inequalities are disproportionately compounding the consequences faced by female youth who are unemployed. In this world, we can best describe opportunity through the metaphorical table with limited seats built around it. The struggle to occupy these seats, rhetoric to proclaiming more men to be competent and able has meant that women found themselves as less favorable candidates for a seat at the table. And when we do finally get a seat, we receive less compensation for our roles. Now, over time, this has led to male-oriented policy and decision-making, as well as systems built to mainly support the needs of the majority. This makes it increasingly difficult for women to break glass ceilings, as we endure unsuitable conditions to attempt to accomplish the same goal. And this is why empowering the girl is so important. When you empower the girl, you create a chain of empowerment spanning along families and other girls. Allowing them to believe in their ability to contribute to society will motivate them to pursue their dreams autonomously and not believe themselves incapable or unable to achieve career goals. After all, this is every girl's human right. It is a generally agreeable and rational statement that all individuals should receive the same opportunity. So as reflected in employment to population ratios of the female workforce, unequal pay, and share of domestic workload in the average heterosexual household, our world does not show this being followed. By simply continuing to think rationally about our world and questioning social norms which are known to be hampering progress, we youth can collectively better advocate for change. And by questioning the ways in which organizations and government offices operate, we can better identify social gaps. Our age, though, is commonly seen as an aspect of our identities making us uns suited for advocacy. Due to our age, youth lack formal experience addressing goals in an industry setting or globalized organization. 
However, this also means that we are not limited in thought by existing governmental frameworks that may already be put in place. This helps youth to bring vital creativity in the approach of ideas, especially in areas like climate action and empowerment of girls where cookie cutter solutions have proved simply ineffective through the scale of change the world needs to see, it is of utmost importance. Similarly, having more female and minority youth advocates would provide a more equitable platform towards lasting solutions on a global scale. Aside from our voices, one of the most powerful tools that we have as a generation is our use of digital media as it allows for the sharing of information without restraint. Social media and other channels of communication like the internet are places where one can access information while being exposed to multiple perspectives on the same issue. Information campaigns, whether they be for a local organization promoting a girls' leadership camp or one involving you sharing informational posts about menstrual health on Instagram, help to spread awareness to others. If we all spend a small amount of time reading about issues affecting girls like child marriage, we'd become liaisons of this information capable of sharing our knowledge and building on it in our communities. Occupying leadership roles in local level initiatives, especially youth girls, can also help build an environment for girls to succeed. With my organization, Dimensions Magazine, more than 90% of our executive team members are female identifying. And this is a statistic that makes me incredibly proud as it reminds me that opportunities for female youth involvement exist. In discussions, we get to hear from a diverse group of voices with different perspectives, but a unified passion for our cause, which enhances the reach of our organization. When you recruit more women and girls in initiatives, you allow for them and the cause to flourish. As youth change makers, having a lens of global awareness is important as it makes us all more conscious about the ways we live our lives and helps us gain an appreciation for our position in the world. In order for us to scale up individual and local level initiatives towards global involvement, youth need to be taking part civically in communities to be aware of which issues affect them, as well as in what ways action can be taken to address gaps. This means taking part in all elections you can so that your opinion doesn't go missed reading or watching the news, talking about global issues in your conversations with family and friends, and questioning what you read or what you think to be true. Let us learn to embrace disagreements over global issues as an opportunity to broaden our awareness and not sow anger and division. There are many things which distinguish today's generation from youth, of youth from other generations, like our beliefs and our thoughts. However, to be able to take substantial, meaningful and lasting action on any time-sensitive issues facing the world like gender inequality, it requires intergenerational collaboration and solidarity. Youth provide a perspective to problem solving which other generations don't have. The complex time and space of the 21st century has meant that growing up, we've had a heightened awareness of our world's biggest challenges. With increasing globalization, our generation is incredibly diverse and thus multifaceted. Armed with our complex backgrounds, which we learn from and boldly carry forward at the forefront of our identities. However, decision-making positions are not yet occupied by youth, and while we are the future, we have monumental challenges to tackle, which requires changes to governmental procedures right now. To begin tackling time-sensitive issues, youth need to begin collaborating with our government officials and those in positions of influence. Continued collaboration can ensure meaningful steps are taken to minimize long overlooked disparities. Youth were not the first to realize that there is a power in both conviction and number, but we were the first to harness it on a global scale. We've harnessed our voices and spoken up for issues we're passionate about. It is vital that we continue to make ourselves and other communities heard. Together, we represent opportunity and inclusivity, the ability to transcend expectations, social norms and barriers, and forward thinking. Each one of us has the potential to lift others up, and should all believe that our collective goals can be obtained. Remember that you are not too young, you are never too loud, you are never too demanding or aggressive as a youth advocate, and that it is never too late to begin taking action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neha, for throwing light on the importance of educating women and girls young and how we as today's youth can make a change. That was a delightful, enriching, and empowering address. It was a perfect end to our series. So 
uh, having said that, now we've come almost with me at the end of today's session. I now request Dr. D.B. Usharani, Vice Principal, Aided Stream, Associate Professor and Head, Asian Research Department of Economics at Raj College for Women, Chennai, to felicitate today's speakers. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon to one and all uh, present um, through uh, Jimmy as well as um, YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, channel. Um, yeah. Uh, to all the speakers of uh, today, I have been through um, many programs for the past um, uh, many years, but today I am very much delighted uh, to be with the uh, youngsters on this uh, International Youth Day. Everybody should understand um, that each day should be a, a happy International uh, Youth Day for all the youth of the globe. Um, my um, uh, congratulations to all the speakers, starting with uh, Ms. Sally Mahe, who spoke on building a better um, global community through uh, youth action in URI. And um, special thanks to um, um, and congratulations to Ms. Sundara Gurushev, uh, who spoke on climate crisis and uh, climate action um, tracker. And um, I have to um, uh, congratulate um, each and every one of you. And a special thanks um, to Dr. Uh, Sultan um, Khalifa, who has been uh, coordinating with all the colleges um, uh, throughout and um, uh, and the way he spoke uh, really made uh, each one of us to understand uh, the um, uh, demerits of uh, climate change, um, uh, both in uh, Tamil as well as uh, in English. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Sultan uh, Khalifa. And uh, Ms. Zara Nadim is uh, not uh, new to Itraj. Her um, uh, mother-in-law is uh, actually, uh, uh, she was a retired uh, professor from um, uh, physics uh, department. Uh, uh, congratulations to you, uh, uh, Ms. Zara Nadim, uh, who has spoken on, uh, I will say, the cost-benefit analysis and the economic aspect of uh, growing your own vegetable. Uh, congratulations to you, Zara. And um, uh, the uh, uh, Neha. Neha has uh, uh, talked about uh, the quality education uh, through which uh, we have to have uh, uh, gender equality. And uh, as she said, uh, uh, today's youth are the change makers. So to each and every one of the youth you, uh, who have assembled uh, uh, through this um, online international uh, webinar uh, program, my congratulations. And uh, the basic idea of uh, listening to these speakers, uh, one thing they have achieved in their own areas. The other thing is, the fundamental idea of their speech is to build a globe um, from different aspects they have given a better place for the youngsters to live in the future. Uh, and to uh, the Stalamaris, um, Dr. Uh, Rebecca David Prasad, as well as uh, the volunteers, student volunteers who are doing uh, really well to conduct this program. Congratulations. Uh, and uh, to Dr. Malini and the team in Itraj College. Uh, and to all the organizers, uh, the collaborative organizers, uh, Stella Maris, WCC, Madras Christian College, Itraj, Ayman College of Arts, um, Fatima College, Madurai, Hasin B.V. Abdur Qadar College. Um, congratulations and my heartfelt uh, uh, felicitation. And um, I promise uh, Dr. Khalif that um, um, uh, we will definitely uh, make the students to understand uh, the 17 um, uh, sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, definitely, we'll uh, look forward to have uh, more of uh, these uh, collaborative uh, webinars and uh, competitions uh, for that will be conducted in future for all our students as well as other college students. Thank you, one and all. Thank you so much, ma'am. Gratitude is the most powerful catalyst for happiness and joy. Having said that, I invite Dr. Tabitha. Dean R&D, Madras Christian College, Chennai, to propose the word of thanks. Thank you. As we celebrate the International Youth Day, it is a reminder of the role that each of us have to play today. These two hours have been uh, insightful and an enlightening experience. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the speakers, Ms. Sally Mahe, Ms. Sundara Gurushev, Dr. Sultan Khalifa, Ms. Neha Gupta, and Ms. Zahira Nadeep. I also take this opportunity to express our immense gratitude towards 
uh, Dr. Sultan, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Student Program Regional Officer for Asia Pacific, uh, in making all of this possible in the first place. We thank all the organizers from Stella Varis College, Women's Christian College, Madras Christian College, Etraj College for Women, Kasim B. V. Abdul Khadar College for Women, Amen College for Arts and Science for Women, and Fatima College from Madurai. We appreciate and thank all the participant college, colleges for having taken their first steps towards inspiring and guiding the youth. We truly appreciate all the efforts of the organizers. Uh, we thank all those who have made uh, technical arrangements for today at each uh, venue, the venue organizers, and all the enthousi enthusiastic faculty who have been a part of this program. And above all, we thank the Lord Almighty for this wonderful experience again and wish each and every one of you the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You are only young ones, and if you work it right, once is more than enough. So let's all get together and work it right and walk towards a sustainable tomorrow. We bid adieu and are delighted to see this event come to an end on such a high-spirited note. So thank you all. Thank you so much.